don't give up on friendship. I know you've had some bad experiences and that fucking sucks. I promise you there are friends out there who won't leave you high and dry. We say that to people when they're dating, you know? Just keep going out there, keep meeting people. We don't say that about friendship, but it's true. Just because you haven't found friends who will value you and love you and spend time with you outside of their romantic relationship doesn't mean that you won't. Hey everyone, I'm Hayes. I make the advice column, Hello Hayes, and I'm new here on YouTube. I have a couple of episodes up now. Check it out, watch this one, and if you like it, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the like button. Okay, back to the show. Hello Hazelnuts and welcome back to the show. In our first letter, we hear from someone named Intentionally Single who talks about her frustrations with platonic friendship and romantic relationships on a big scale. And then we have the opposite perspective. Maybe it's not opposite exactly, but it's from someone who's in a relationship and is noticing these changes among her single friends. They're writing about that shift in any group of friends when some people are now single, some people are engaged, some people have really serious jobs, other people don't. I mean, whatever the shift is, she's talking about that moment when you and your friends are no longer on the same page. Your interests are now different. And what do you do? And our third letter isn't exactly a letter. It's a comment that I got on a recent TikTok that I've been thinking about nonstop, but it relates to this topic and I'll tell you about it when we get there. So Hazelnuts, this conversation about single friends and partnered friends is one of the most challenging to talk about. So before I read these letters and start talking about my opinion and what I think, I wanna be really clear that I don't think I'm right. I do love being right, and I love when people tell me I'm right because I'm human, but I don't think I'm right here. I don't think there's actually a right or wrong. I think that we are in conversation. The perspective that I bring to you today is based on, sure, my experience. It's based on me sitting here with my computer trying to flush out what I think but it's also based on what I've been hearing from you. And the conversation doesn't end right now. I'm hoping that we can see this show as a way for us to be communicating with each other and learning together. And I've actually never felt that more since starting this podcast and specifically starting the YouTube version of the podcast. I realized that on TikTok, when you leave comments, you can only have a certain number of characters. But something that I've enjoyed about being on YouTube is that you can leave really long comments. And I wanna read a comment from Becky. Becky's one of the hazelnuts in our community. Becky pulled out a trend that I hadn't actually I don't think I had actually noticed it. So Becky wrote, I just realized that one of the many things I love about your advice and podcast is how seriously it takes often female friendships, often female was in parentheses. I think we live in a society that often doesn't take these relationships as seriously as family or romantic partners, but in the year of Barbie and Taylor Swift reigning supreme, to have someone so thoughtfully discuss female friendships is a gift. I appreciate that compliment. But that is really what we're doing here. We're talking about friendship because friendship really matters. Friendship has mattered so much in my life. Friendship is actually, friendship is even the foundation of my romantic relationship. Friendship is everything. This comment helped me zoom out and see that friendship, I talk about friendship. <laughs> what? Friendship is one of the core themes of Hello Haze. And I'm so glad that it is because it's, it's an area where I've experienced a lot of pain, where I've made a lot of mistakes but it's also the thing that has saved me and continues to save me. All of that's to say, we are in conversation together. And I would love for us all to use the YouTube space to talk about what we say here together. <laughs> all right, spiel over. Let's dive into our first letter. Hello, Hayes. What is the balance between prioritizing friendship and romantic partnership? And I guess more specifically, what do we owe our single friends who are valuable people in our lives? And what can single friends reasonably expect of partnered friends? I'll admit that I'm bitter, but as an intentionally single person, constantly watching romantic relationships take the only spotlight in friends' lives is very lonely. I watched my former best friend slip away recently because she never suggested plans and she regularly bailed on nights we did plan together to hang out with her boyfriend instead. We're not young and this was not her first relationship and she said she wasn't willing to spend any of her free time away from her partner. Probably most egregiously, my mother canceled a fun trip to Florida to visit friends because her now husband was called into work and couldn't join her anymore. And apparently it never occurred to her to go alone and see her friends anyway. These are extreme examples, but they're not the only times I've witnessed similar patterns with other people. Maybe I have my single goggles on, but why do platonic friendships always have to give way? Why do we expect single friends to come back unhurt and like nothing changed if and when romantic relationships end? This is the single person's point of view, but I value your input as a kind and nuanced married person. What do you think, Hayes? Yours, intentionally single. <sighs> intentionally single. I'm also so curious about what you mean by that. Intentionally single right now, as in I'm choosing not to date right now to focus on myself and my friendships and my work and all of the other rich and wonderful things in life that don't have to do with romantic partnership. Or is this a lifestyle choice as in I, I have made the as in intentionally childless like you've made a decision for your life to to not be in a relationship I'm so curious by that choice of words before we really talk about your letter I just want to acknowledge and validate the experience of 
being burned by friends. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that experience of feeling left behind while a friend or someone close to you enters a new season and isn't nurturing your relationship in the way that you feel you are or that you want to. And it doesn't just happen when one person enters a relationship. I think this happens with career. It can happen with mental health struggles. It can happen when one person experiences loss. I'm so interested by your question, what do partnered friends owe their single friends who are valuable people in their lives? So much of it is dependent on if both people are actually invested in the friendship. A brutal truth is that sometimes we have friends that we are more invested in. I say that not to comment on your specific relationships, but in general, when we're like, what do our partnered friends owe us? Well, the answer really depends on whether they see you as a person they want to keep in your life. It could be that this friend has attachment issues or is getting swept up in the honeymoon period or isn't a good friend. Or it could just mean that it's revealing to you in plain sight what this friendship actually was the entire time. For the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about friendships where they are on the same page. To go back to your question, what do partnered people owe their single friends and what can single friends expect of their partnered ones? I love the words owe and expect. They're so charged and hazelnuts know that I love to unpack really charged language. So let's start with what do we owe? What do we owe our single friends? The concept of owing someone is funny business because there's two extreme ends of the spectrum. On one end, there's a crew that's like, we don't know anyone anything. Then on the other end, there are people who view their relationships always in terms of principle, tit for tat, and they measure the relationship based on a checklist of who's doing what for who. I find that those types of thinkers don't often create, don't often leave room for nuance and flexibility, which are really important things in any relationship. In that way, owing, using the language, what does someone owe me, it can be a dangerous word. It can quickly lead to entitlement if it's not being used by a reasonable person leveraging their emotional intelligence. And we can all be unreasonable sometimes. So if you are in a state of mind or you're facing a challenge and you're sort of losing your ability to think critically and to make sound choices, which I certainly, certainly happens to me all of the time, talking about what someone owes us can become, it can make us inflexible and it can quickly be a way to lose friends. Meaningful, sustainable relationships, they involve thoughtfulness and compromise and stepping out of oneself from time to time to cater to somebody else's needs, to show up for people in the way that they need, not just the way that you want to be shown up for. For example, I do not like going to clubs, okay? I hate going to clubs. I really am not a big partier. I was never a big partier. Lots of my friends do. Lots of my good friends like to party. And when they celebrate something important or joyful in their lives, they want to celebrate by going to a club or going to a rave or just doing something that I don't like to do. I will do that for them when it matters to them, even though I don't like doing those things myself. Part of being a good friend for me means stepping out of my comfort zone sometimes to celebrate my friends the way they want to be celebrated. Do I owe it to any of my friends to celebrate them in ways that they want to be celebrated even though I don't like it? I guess, but I wouldn't use that language because I don't think about my relationships in terms of what I owe them or what they owe me. I do things because I love them and because I want to make them feel special in the ways that they want to feel special. I don't think about my friends in terms of what I owe them or what they owe me. I do things, I do things for them that might put me outside of my comfort zone because I love them and I want them to feel special and they do the same for me. But to indulge your question, what do we owe our single friends who we love and value? Here's what I owe my single friends. We owe our single friends quality time, not necessarily the same amount of time because the pie is split differently now, but the same quality of time and care. We owe our single friends our interest and curiosity about their season of life. We owe our single friends our celebration of their accomplishments, of their joys that don't have to do with being in a relationship because there is more to life than being in a romantic relationship. And in general, we should stop celebrating people only when they get engaged or get married or have a baby. We owe our single friends sensitivity and discretion when it's necessary. For example, if they're struggling, if they're sad right now about the fact that they're not in a relationship, maybe we don't sit there and brag about how amazing ours is. At the same time, we shouldn't isolate our single friends and assume they don't wanna hear about our life and our relationship simply because we're afraid of hurting their feelings. We owe our single friends doing single girl things when it matters and when they ask. 
And a single girl thing can mean, I don't know, it can mean whatever you want it to mean. And this last one happens maybe later in life as fewer people in the friend group become single. But we owe our single friends recognition of their experience as a single person. That isn't a blanket statement because some people who are single won't view it as part of their identity. But if it is part of their identity, if it's something they're going, if it's something that they feel like they're going through, it matters to them, it's a topic of interest for them, we should acknowledge that topic of interest. We shouldn't erase their singlehood because it makes us uncomfortable. We also owe our single friends specificity and not just assuming they're like every other single person we know because they're single. They're still our friend with unique experiences and feelings and we should wanna know what it's like for them. And this one's super specific, but I also think we owe the single people in our life our attention when we're in situations that call out their singleness in a way that might be uncomfortable for them. For example, if you go to a wedding and you have one single friend and everybody else is in a relationship, you can make sure that you're keeping an eye on that single friend and that you're looping, you're grabbing them to dance with you on the dance floor, that you're going to get shots with them, that you're hanging out with them and not leaving them by themselves because they're single. So those are, those are some things. Now that we've talked about the what we owe part of your question, I wanna talk about the second, which was what can we expect of partnered friends? Well. From the people in your life who are good friends and who want to be good friends, I think you can expect the things that I just listed. But I also think that we should not lump all of our partnered friends into one bucket. So the question isn't, what can I expect of my partnered friends? It's what can I expect of this partnered friend and that partnered friend? Because remember, six besties theory, our friends each have different purposes in our life. What you can expect from a good time bestie who enters a new romantic relationship might be different than what you can expect from your North Star bestie who now is in a relationship. And what you can expect from someone who's actually a good friend is going to be different from somebody who was a casual friend. In your letter, you wrote, why do platonic friendships always have to give way? Well, I think at this point, you know that I think they don't always have to give way. They may have given way in your experiences, but I don't think they always have to do that. But in reflecting more about why... Why do some people seem to let go of all of their platonic friendships when they're in a relationship? Because I know that that category of person does exist. Sometimes we have a friend and their personality type, we can sort of expect that once they get in a relationship, we know they're gonna be gonzo. But sometimes it happens and it surprises us. And the reality is that relationships do transform people and we can't predict how that's going to happen until it happens. You know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't study attachment styles. And I generally try to avoid using therapy speak in psychology language in my work because I'm not an expert on those things. I'm an expert in my experience and observations and writing. I don't know what the fuck I'm an expert in, but here I am. But there are plenty of psychological reasons why some people might cling to their partners once they enter a romantic relationship. Maybe somebody had a traumatic, unstable childhood and they never had a sense of family. So now that they're in a relationship and they finally feel that they have this stable sense of family, they may cling on to that and hold on to that in a way that's destructive to other areas of their life because it's bringing up all of these emotions from childhood. And if you know this about them, if you know that someone had an unstable traumatic childhood, then maybe you can expect that this transition to being in a safe, happy relationship might be bumpy for them. You could give them grace and patience in that situation. If you yourself are in a relationship and you're noticing that you feel super, super attached to your new partner, you only wanna spend time with them, it's a great thing to talk about with a therapist and figure out why you might feel that way. That's a question I always stop and ask myself whenever I'm having an extreme emotion that I can't really back up with evidence. I would ask myself, what is this bringing up for me? Why do I feel this way? However, I think generally, you know, if a person is a solid friend and doesn't have mental health related attachment issues, I think you can expect the things that I listed before and what we owe our single friends. But I think you also must expect change, which leads me to you. You mentioned your bitterness as an aside in this letter. I know I'm bitter, but, but I don't think we should ever discount how our hurt does shape the way we see and behave in the world, how it stops us from tapping into our empathy and understanding other people, makes us lose our patience. If you've been repeatedly burned by people that you thought were friends, you've watched your mother make choices that you don't approve of or agree on, or things that you with distance can see have actually hurt her, you might be unfairly thinking about some of the relationships in your life. I have no doubt that people have burned you and that you've experienced real pain and that people have been bad friends to you. I don't doubt that. But I also want to leave room for the possibility that because of those experiences, you're being harsh on people or you might not be being as flexible as a good friend needs to be or having big reactions to things that might not warrant it. So the examples you gave me though, again, they do seem egregious, but it was very interesting to me 
but you felt the example about your mom was more egregious than others. And I think it's interesting because that example doesn't actually directly impact you. It impacts you in the sense that it's your mother, but your mom's friendships, her relationships aren't yours. So I would encourage you to think about how did this impact me? What was the direct impact on me? Because if your mom not going on her Florida trip with her friends feels the most egregious to you, we got to unpack why. I want you to think about why do you care about that so much? I'm sure you have a really valid reason and we got to figure out what it is. I thought the most egregious example that you gave was your friend saying that she isn't willing to spend any free time without her boyfriend. I mean, I'd love to be a fly on the wall to hear if that was verbatim or if she said something like, I'm really stretched thin right now and between work and my boyfriend, I don't have that much free time. I'm curious if it was something like that which can be interpreted to mean I'm only spending my free time with my boyfriend. It can certainly be interpreted like that. Or if she verbatim said, I'm not willing to spend any free time without him. That's an egregious example for sure. That friend, even that friend though that you're giving as an example, if the friendship was otherwise strong and sturdy, I'm curious about why not give that friend some grace in that moment. There are friends that I have not spent time with in a year and I'd hope they wouldn't just write me off as a former friend because I haven't seen them this year. Continuing on the topic of you, if we're going to ask what partnered friends owe you as a single person and what you can expect of them, you also have to think about what you owe them and what they can expect of you. And I think one of those things is flexibility. If your partnered friend is giving you quality time, maybe not the same amount of quality time, but they're, they're giving you quality time. They're showing excitement for things in your life. They're looping you in. You should be flexible with them when they're not available, when they are spending time with their partner. I also think that you shouldn't ask them to choose. I would struggle with any friendships or any relationships where they were asking me to choose. I'm fortunate that my partner, Rob, does ne- never asks me to pick between him or my friends. And I'm fortunate that I have friends that don't ask me to pick. Don't put your friends in a position to choose. I also think that you should realize that their time is being split differently now. It's a small intellectual shift But realizing that a person, if the person, if your friend is in a monogamous relationship, they have one partner and they have many friends. So the time, the pie is split differently now and you should bring that understanding to the table. You also should give them permission to change just like you have permission to change in your own life. When your friend gets into a relationship, they're not gonna be the same person they were before. Hopefully they become better. My relationship with Rob has definitely changed my friendships. It's made most of them better. And you know what it also did? My relationship made me more confident and thoughtful and aware of myself as a person. And it gave me the courage to also end some friendships that weren't good for me. One part of your letter that gave me pause was, why do we expect single friends to come back unhurt and like nothing changed if and when romantic relationships end? That gave me pause. You know, if this friend... so. If this hypothetical friend, the one that's been in a relationship and now has broken up with their partner, if they haven't shunned you out, but the relationship has changed, because again, the time is more split and people change, it seems sad to say about them, why should I let them back like nothing has changed? A piece of their life is gone. Something that took up time and emotional energy in their life isn't there anymore. So naturally, they are going to have more time for the friendship piece of the puzzle. Now, if that person was a crappy friend that made you feel bad about yourself, fine. But if that person didn't do those things, actually was a good friend, they never stopped being a good friend. They just weren't as available and as present as they were when they were single and they were in a different place in their life. Why would you punish them for that? And I think that calls on us for when we're in a season of life and our friends are in a different season of life, when our instinct is to say, well, they're being a bad friend. They've changed. They're not there for me anymore. We need to pause and say, well, is that actually true? Or are things just different? How do I feel when I'm with this person? Because maybe you're just thinking about it all wrong. (laughs) Maybe your expectations of them are unrealistic. Maybe you expected nothing to change. And if you go through life expecting nothing to change as your friends' lives change, then you are going to be disappointed because change is part of life. I definitely think It's possible to have friends who are in different seasons of life as you, but don't forget, I did create the seasonal bestie for a reason. The seasonal bestie is the person who's in the same season of life as you. As a single person, your partnered friends might serve a different role in your life than your single friends do. If you say you're intentionally single, which I, which again, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. I think you would benefit from having some people in your life who are, 
who see the world in the same way as you on that topic. If you invest time in friendships with other single people, you might notice then that you stop putting so much pressure on your partnered friends to be exactly who they were before because you're getting you're getting that energy from other areas of your life. This is why Six Besties Theory exists and why it fucking rocks. The last thing I wanna say is just don't, don't give up on friendship. I know you've had some bad experiences and that fucking sucks, but don't give up on friendship because I promise you there are friends out there who won't leave you high and dry. I feel like we say that to people when they're dating, you know? You're dating and you're not finding the one, just keep going out there, keep meeting people. And we don't say that about friendship, but it's true. Just because you haven't found friends who will value you and love you and spend time with you outside of their romantic relationship, just because you haven't found them yet doesn't mean that you won't. Don't give up. Please don't let your past experience or what you've witnessed with your mom color your view of what friendship can be to the point where you don't give people a shot. And I hope that in talking about this and in going through all of the different ways to think about this, you'll take some responsibility for the way that you might be thinking about things. You'll have new clarity about what these friendships and relationships can be, what you can expect, but please don't give up hope. Your letter opened my eyes and made me think about things in a new way. And I've been thinking about it nonstop since I received it. And I know I'm gonna keep thinking about it more and have a million more things to say that I, and I bet I'll wish I'll have said them in this video and I won't and I'm gonna have to, you know, a challenging part of my job is thinking about things later and realizing, oh, I wish I could have said that. But you know what? For me to reframe that, that's actually not a challenging part of my job. It's an incredible opportunity because I get to show up each week and answer new letters and bring what I learned last time to the new letter. So I thank you for that intentionally single because you've opened my eyes, not just in this letter, but I'll be thinking about your words and your perspective and letters for the future. But just don't give up. Don't give up. And partnered people are thinking about this in thoughtful ways too. And this next letter gives you a little glimpse into that. Hello, Hayes. Nothing's really wrong, but something doesn't feel quite right either. I don't know how to articulate what I'm trying to say, but maybe writing this letter will help. I'm in my late 20s and live in a big coastal city with a medium-ish group of girlfriends. We were all single together for the first few years out of college and generally we're on the same page in life. We went to workout classes and brunches, drinks after work. Things have changed over the last couple of years as we've gotten older. I just got engaged, for example, and I'm so excited about it. But I've noticed that right around the time that my relationship got more serious, I also felt more distance from some of my friends, two friends in particular, both of whom are single. I wouldn't notice it if I only saw them in a large group, but these were two girls that I'd often spend time with individually or the three of us together. And to make it more complicated, I went to camp with one of them and college with the other. So I actually introduced them. Again, this isn't a problem per se, but there's a vibe shift that if I'm honest, is making me uncomfortable. Our conversations don't feel as meaningful or deep as they used to. They don't ask me questions about my relationship or things that are on my mind in this stage of life. But in fairness, I also feel nervous to bring it up because I don't want to seem insensitive. I also feel a little left out, which is ridiculous because I know I could join them whenever I want to. It's not like they're excluding me when they go out together on Fridays and I don't even really want to go. The honest truth is that I'm exhausted at the end of the week and my ideal Friday is relaxing at home with my fiance on the couch. I'd love for my friends to come over and hang and be low key, but I just don't want to go out and party with them. Does that make me a bad friend? I feel guilty about it sometimes. Like I'm one of those girls who just wants to be with her boyfriend, but is it bad if I do want to be with him? I guess my question for you, Hayes, is whether this shift is normal or not. Is this just something that happens in friendship? Is it worth addressing? Should I be doing something differently? Yours, Friday at home. <sighs> I think you've articulated the growing pains of friendship really well. That's what this is. It's a growing pain. You're not a bad person for having your interests change and for having the way that you want to recharge change. You're not a bad person for craving deeper connections, and you're definitely not a bad person for not wanting to party like you used to. I really relate to the Friday night thing. I went through that shift too when I moved in with Brian, that suddenly like I wanted to spend Friday nights in particular at home with him. And in thinking about it more and reflecting on it more, I think it's actually less about wanting to be with Brian at the end of the week and wanting to spend a Friday at home with him, but it's about I want to just be with myself and my partner is an extension of myself. I actually think that we conflate the two sometimes. People can be like, well, why does so-and-so just want to be at home all night with their boyfriend? Every Friday now, they used to go out all the time and now they want to be at home with their boyfriend. When in reality, the person might just want to recharge. Being home with their boyfriend or their partner is very similar to the feeling of being alone. It recharges the body and the soul in a similar way. Now, being with friends is also an essential form of recharging and not just in a social way. I have friends with whom it also feels like being alone, being at home. Different friends will recharge me in different ways. So I feel you on the Friday thing. I don't think you're a bad person for wanting to stay home on Friday. 
I do think you should stretch yourself though and not do that every Friday. It's important sometimes to step outside of our comfort zone. And when I was living in New York and I felt this way and most of my friends were in New York with me, there'd be Fridays where I was like, you know what? There'd be Fridays where I'd have dinner plans and I'd be like, oh, I kind of just want to stay home and chill and do nothing. But every time I went out with my friends who I love, the key is doing this with friends who you actually like. I never regretted it. But before we talk about that, before we talk about stretching ourselves and things that I think you can differently, I also want to talk about feeling jealous. Acknowledging your jealousy is so valuable and I'm so proud of you for that. Jealousy is one of those feelings that we can feel so ashamed of that we don't admit it. We associate jealousy with crazy behavior, but jealousy is a completely normal feeling and it can be harmless when you don't couple it with action, which you're not doing right now. So kudos to you. Even secure, confident, happy people can feel jealous and you can feel jealous of things that you don't even want. It sounds like there's some jealousy going on in watching two of your friends become seasonal besties. And that's a theme I see in so many of my letters, especially when one friend has introduced two other friends and then you notice that they're becoming close and developing their own relationship. It's a normal feeling to come up, but I want you to reframe it into thinking that you've actually done a really great thing. We know how important it is to have seasonal besties who are in your same stage of life. If the two of them right now are in the same season in their dating lives and their singlehood, it's really good that they have each other. Having each other and having their relationship and being connected in their singlehood and all of the other wonderful things that I'm sure they're connected in, the fact that they have each other will actually make them better friends to you and to other people. Because again, we all need different people in our lives to fill different buckets. It's okay to feel jealous or left out of their bond allow yourself to feel that, but also couple it with pride. You matched them. <laughs> you did a good thing. It's like you set them up. You can feel the same pride you'd feel at successfully setting up a romantic relationship. You can feel that for your two friends. That's it actually. Why do we only feel pride when we successfully match people in love? Feel that same pride that you created this beautiful friendship that for them, I'm sure is so important right now. You matched them. So feel proud of that. Feel the same pride you would if you set up a couple. Now I wanna talk about being in different seasons and your question, is, is this just what happens? Do friendships just change like this? And I do think that it's normal to grow out of some friendships, which I don't think people like to hear, especially as your priorities and your interests change. I don't know if that's happening here though. I think that, again, you're just in a growing pain period. And part of making it through this growing pain period is showing interest for what matters to your friends. You showing interest in what matters to them right now and also them showing interest in what matters to you. Part of growing through this period is showing respect for each other and the seasons of life that you're in. You might not be able to understand each other's seasons, but you can show interest in them. And when we show interest for people, I think we start to realize that we can actually relate to each other more than we think. The feelings that they have about being single might actually look similar to some of the feelings that you have about starting this new season of your life. The what is different, what we're stressed about, what we're talking about might feel different, but a lot of the feelings are the same. And the more you talk about this, the more honest you are with each other, and the more you question each other, I think you might start to realize that you're not actually that different. I think you might start to get the intimacy and the connection with them that you're craving. So what should you do differently? I think there's a couple of things. First, you mentioned that they don't talk with you about the things that you're going through. That might be valid. But first, I want you to ask yourself, have I asked them about the things that they're going through? You're feeling uncomfortable with the fact that you can't relate to their singlehood right now. Have you shown any interest in what their lives are like as single people? The interest that you crave them to show about your life, model what that looks like by showing your interest in their life. The questions that you want them to ask you, ask them those questions. Because of the jealousy and some of these things that you're feeling, you might unfairly be assuming that they don't wanna hear about your life or that they're uncomfortable talking about being single with you. And they might be picking up on that. They might be like, she doesn't want to hear about this. She feels uncomfortable, so we're not talking about it. You can kind of rise to the occasion and break the ice and set the standard for what you want this relationship to be now. You can also prompt a conversation about the seasons of life and the seasons of friendship and how things are changing. It doesn't need to be so direct about you guys, but more high level, like, Next time you go out for drinks or something, you can say, you know, I've been thinking recently about how we're all in different stages of life, but also the same stage. Like we're all the same age, yet 
things look so different for each of us. And it makes me sad sometimes that things have changed and I can't really explain why. Do you guys ever feel that? Saying something like that could spark a really interesting conversation. And during that conversation, notice how you feel. Seeing how they respond, how you feel in the conversation, that can inform whether you try to have these conversations again, but you have to try. And one-on-one conversations can sometimes feel safer or more successful than two-on-one. So maybe you initiate some more one-on-one time with each of these friends, and that might actually help fill some of these gaps that you're feeling anyway, if you have some quality one-on-one time with these friends. One-on-one time has actually been a really important way for me to maintain a lot of my friendships with people who are in relationships and with people who aren't. And one-on-one time can be meeting for a coffee, going for a walk, Now that I live far away from many of my friends from, now that I live far away from many of my friends, it means phone calls. I make lots of phone calls. Not as many phone calls as I should actually. I haven't been the best in the last few weeks about, it's probably been a few months. I haven't been the best in the last few months at staying in touch with people because I've had tunnel vision on some other things. But that's part of my season of life right now. And I'm grateful that my friends know I love them. I have to hold myself accountable and make those phone calls, right? but I wouldn't want someone to write me off because I haven't called in a few months. The only other thing I'd add is that I would make sure if these friendships do matter to you and if you're noticing that you do feel left out when they go out with each other on Friday nights, I would maybe try to do some of that. Step outside of your comfort zone. It's just a night and truly spending a night out with your friends, even if it means stretching yourself when you feel tired and you'd rather just be hanging at home, it helps. It nurtures the relationship and you do need to nurture the relationship. You need to nurture your friendships. You'll be happy when you get there. So many times I haven't wanted to leave the house, not because I want to be home with Brian. I mean, it's nice that Brian's there, but because I just, I've become comfortable in my life. I'm comfortable at home. You need to force yourself to go out and to see these people that matter to you. You can also invite them over. You mentioned that you'd love for them to come over on a Friday night. Invite them over, do that. Don't assume they don't want to come just because they have this other plan. Why don't you have a whole fun festive night for the girls and invite everybody over? That might make you feel really good too. Remember, you're a connector. That's my homework for you. Text the group and invite them over for a Friday night. Have that wine night at home on the couch that you want, but also make a plan to go out with these friends. Say, hey, I want to come out with you next time you do this. How's Friday? Suggest a day. Doing both of those things in tandem will make you feel more in control of the changes that are happening. And of course, have the conversation. Have the conversation too. Prompt those deeper conversations with your friends and see how it goes. Because yes, the shifts that you're noticing are part of friendship, but you can grow through them instead of growing out of them if you're conscious about nurturing the relationship and stepping outside of your comfort zone like we've discussed. Don't let the relationships that matter to you go. Don't let them go. Let them grow. Love it when I rhyme. And letter three isn't actually a letter, but it's a comment that I got on a recent TikTok video that I've been thinking a lot about. So here it is. Hello, Hayes. I'm curious to hear at what point does it become that your friend is taking advantage of knowing you'll always be there? Sometimes it's nice to be chosen. Well, I think part of this does come down to gut instincts. If you feel like your friend is taking advantage of you, how has the friendship already gotten to that point? The first step in sussing that out if a friend is taking advantage of you, is always being self-aware. Being self-aware is the foundation of everything. I wouldn't suggest ever making a decision or cutting somebody out or confronting a friend unless you are also doing some self-reflection. If you are wondering whether your friend is taking advantage of you, something is wrong. Either this friendship isn't a good friendship or you have some reevaluating to do of yourself and your own expectations of the people around you. Because I think it's possible that you could be interpret someone taking advantage of you when really they're just being a human in the world and prioritizing many different things and wearing many hats. But I do think, I think a fair goal, a good goal for yourself is to have people in your life who they could cancel plans. You could go without speaking to them for a long amount of time. And your first thought would not be, well, they're taking advantage of the fact that they know I'll always be there and I'll always love them. That's not a healthy way to view your relationships. Sometimes it's nice to be chosen. Wh- why? If you're, if you're feeling that way in your life, sometimes it's nice to be chosen. I wish people would choose me. We have to reflect more on why we want to be chosen. Because when you put people in your life, when you take the people that matter to you and you put them in a position to choose you over something else, that's not a good position to put people in. 
I do understand and empathize the desire to be chosen though. And in relationships, you should feel like you're being chosen, but I wouldn't label it that. If you're going through your life noticing who's choosing you, who's not choosing you, that's a sign of a deeper internal issue. It might also be a sign that you're choosing the wrong friends, but that's also an internal issue. Why am I choosing the wrong friends? Why am I choosing to spend time with people who don't care about me. At the end of the day, it can always come back to us, which I find to be very empowering. It can be scary and hard to realize that, oh, hey, I'm part of the problem, but we're always part of the problem. When I'm faced with a problem in my social life, in my work, I'm always part of the problem. And the best part about that is that I can also always be part of the solution. If you feel like, I just wish my friends would choose me more, sometimes it would be nice to be chosen. I think you need to reflect more on what this is bringing up for you and why you're asking that question. Because there's a chance, I don't know your friendships, I don't know who it is that you're feeling this way about. It's a chance that this has so much more to do with you than with them. I ask myself that question all the time. What does it say that I'm feeling this right now? What is this reminding me of? I'll give you a very personal example. I read most of my TikTok comments. I try not to read all of them and I have some personal I've been trying to monitor the way I read them because sometimes it can be too much for me. There was a video recently that I made that ignited a big opinion. There were some comments on that video that really upset me and they really triggered me. And I had some plans that day to go be with my friend Lauren. So I went to go see her and I told her like, I'm kind of in a bad headspace right now. And I told her what some of the comments were. And one of them was, Hayes, I love you, but And after the but was a long list of reasons why someone disagreed with me. I love you, but. I love you, but. And when I told Lauren that, she said, I wonder what that brings up for you. I wonder what place that puts you back in your life, that that that, that language is triggering for you, that I love you, but. And she was so fucking right. It was putting me back in a place in life where I felt like someone's love for me was conditional. I love you, but you're too much. I love you, but you're too needy. I love you, but you're too unstable. Whatever it was. I love you, but you're not talented enough. It brought up every insecurity of mine. I love you, but you're not good enough. You're good in all of these ways, but not in all of these other ways. And once I realized that, oh, that's what this comment is bringing up for me. That's why it feels so triggering because it's reminding me of all these times in my life when I felt this way. It made me feel better. It made me feel more in control of the reaction I was having. So I encourage you to do the same thing. You say sometimes it's nice to be chosen. How do I know that a friend isn't just taking advantage of my kindness and knowing that I'll be there for them? Ask yourself why you feel that way. Why do you feel the need to be chosen? And also, always being there for someone isn't inherently a character flaw. It is if you make it one though, or if you do it for somebody who's a bad person or a toxic friend, or if there's evidence that their presence in your life brings out the worst in you, makes you feel bad about yourself. But generally speaking, creating space in your life for people to grow and drift in one direction and for you to grow and drift in a direction too, but then be able to come back to each other, creating space in your life for that, that's a beautiful thing. Life is long. And imagine how cool it'll be to be able to be at the end of it and look back and think, oh, we were really close and connected at this stage in our life. And then we were close and connected with other people and our priorities shifted. And then we were able to come back to each other with no hard feeling. Imagine how cool and beautiful it'll be if you can be the kind of person that says that. You'll be able to look back and see that you have friends that lasted through all the seasons of life because of the fact that you were always there for each other, even after time had passed. We don't do that for everybody, right? We don't We don't hold space for everybody. Some relationships don't warrant it or deserve it, but some do, and it would be a shame if we missed out on them because we were inflexible or rigid or too resolute on the idea that we must be chosen at all times. If you create that flexibility in the life, trust me, you'll feel the rewards. We need friendship, we need our friends, and we need them to be understanding. We need friends to always be there for us. So don't give up. Don't give up on finding those people and don't give up on yourself for being one of those people for your other friends. All right, that's it for today's Hello Haze. Thanks for tuning in. And if you wanna talk about the things we discussed here, bring up a new perspective, share what something I said made you think about, head to the YouTube comments and we can discuss it all there. I'll be back Tuesday with a new episode. See you then.